this is a place of unseen danger and subtle beauty. It is a mysterious swamp called Okipinoki, the realm of the alligator. National Geographic Specials, made possible by a grant from the people of Chevron. We're proud to bring you television that brings new worlds to your world. Okefenokee, a forbidding place once thought to harbor deadly diseases. It sheltered fugitives, and inspired fear and superstition. Today, Okefenokee Swamp is a well-known wildlife refuge. But even for people like biologist photographer Dr. John Paling, it is not entirely welcoming. Whenever I go back to Okefenokee now, I've got mixed feelings about it. From the air, when you go across it, it looks just so beautiful and so serene and so natural and so appealing. And yet, it can be a place of such contrasts that it seems almost as if man was never intended to be there for long. Okefenokee Swamp is a 438,000-acre natural basin, a mosaic of islands, forests, marshes, and open water. It's famed for its alligators and as the home of Pogo, the comic strip possum. Although it overlaps the Florida state line, most of Okefenokee lies in southeastern Georgia. Okefenokee's population of Seminole Indians was driven out in the 1830s. It was soon infiltrated by white settlers called swampers. By the 1930s, the swampers were well established here, showing off alligator nests and eggs for visiting photographers. The swampers were a breed apart. Many had few needs or interests outside Okefenokee. Those who knew them admired their simplicity and self-reliance. century, virgin stands of cypress brought an invasion of the swamp. This and earlier schemes to build a ship canal through the swamp and even to drain it threatened to destroy Okefenokee. But much of Okefenokee's prime timber was cleared in less than 20 years. Soon the swampers were alone again. In 1937, Okefenokee was declared a national wildlife refuge. The human residents would eventually leave. One old timer said, we have the swamp and that's good, but the swampers are all gone. It's just a shame we can't have both. More than 50 years after they were abandoned, relics of the old logging camps can still be found. Now deep in regrowing forest, 
They're objects of curiosity for biologists like Kent Bleat and John Paling. This is an old crane. Oh, this is. The engine was at front, and there'd be water in this old cylinder. And be After working here for several seasons, Paling, born in England, has become intimately familiar with this Georgia swamp. And there's something even more dramatic over here. Come and have a guess at this. What do you make of this? That's some sort of a chassis. Right. Is that what they uh, carried the logs on? Nope. Try again. Don't forget, we're on an island in the middle of Okefenokee, so try yeah. again. Some sort of a swamp buggy. <laughs> <or something. laughs> it's a car. They had three cars on the island. Really? But That's a heavy... Heavy duty, isn't it? Heavy chassis. But look how well the metal's been preserved. Yeah. And there's another thing to pick out, too. You see why it's so good? It's British. Right hand drive. <laughs> it's a Durant oh, car good. that they brought over on the on the trains. For three right? people. Yeah, there were three cars that would chug up and down. And this thing is preserved so well. Many cars that are ten years old don't have a chassis. No. Like that. Well, that's a very heavy chassis. Right. And it was just to take people up and down. There's a big turpentine still at the end of the island uh -huh. too. Maybe and there was sorry. a cinema. There was a barber shop. All gone now. It's amazing. Yep. When the, trace. when the uh, logging company finished up business, they just tried to get all the people off. And when the National Parks Fish and Wildlife took it, 937. Although parts of Okefenokee can be traversed on foot, it is better explored by boat. The waters of Okefenokee look like polished ebony, dark but highly reflective. It is a landscape of mirrors, fascinating and surreal. Kent Vliet is from the University of Florida. He's an expert on Okefenokee's most famous resident, the alligator. Do you know there's one right in front of us, Joe? Yeah, I can see that one. The ability to call alligators by making certain curious sounds is a valuable skill for inquisitive biologists. That's coming. Oh, hey. Do they have binocular vision? Can they see three dimensions? Only uh, a little small fraction of their total visual field, just in front of their nose. Is Wait, binocular. is he coming too close? No, no he's fine. Wow. Why do they have the yellow ring around their eyes? Is there a function that's known for that? Uh, a number of aquatic animals have a coloration around the eye like that. Hippopotamuses do. It might have something to do with magnifying light going into the eye. Sort of the reverse of a football player putting <gasps> black grease under the eye. To make them see better, in fact. It's going to go down? Oh, there he goes. Ah. How long will they stay underwater? They can stay under a good long time. You know, when they're resting in the afternoon, they go down for at least 15 minutes. Right. He's up again, look. Yeah, there it is. In the winter time, they may stay down for days. Nobody knows. For days and days? I mean, they're really, what, they hibernate? Well, yeah, in the sense it is a hibernation. Their metabolism slows down so much when they're that cold that uh, they, they just require almost no oxygen. And they don't eat, obviously, if they No. They don't eat for several months during the winter. Oh. I think the average member of the public that comes to Okefenokee and sees an alligator thinks they've really arrived in prehistory. <laughs> and back in the, the age of the reptiles. The study of alligators' social behavior has occupied Kent Bleat for several years. At his laboratory in Gainesville, Florida, he works with a wealth of accumulated data. We've learned that alligator behavior is actually very, very complex. It's much more complex and much more sophisticated than the behavior of other reptiles that have been studied. And so our dealings with alligator behavior have been to try to document the types of behaviors they show and analyze these not only in, in simple terms of alligator behavior, but as they might represent the primitive beginnings from which the more complex behaviors of birds and mammals have evolved.
Most of Kent's observations have been made at the St. Augustine alligator farm. Several hundred alligators are on display here for the enlightenment of tourists. The farm affords easy access to an otherwise elusive animal. Before that, just to see if the place would work out. Are there many differences between these gator farm alligators and the ones you get in the wild? No, captive animals look a lot different from wild animals. Uh, the most noticeable difference is that the head of a, of a captive animal is much broader. That you don't have this beautiful elongated snout. That's because captive animals spend so much time on land basking. And at least in old animals like these, the, the head weighs so much that it just tends to flatten itself out over the years. It spreads out and becomes much broader. Is that what also squeezes the teeth out too? Because they're yeah, all showing yeah, very they're very, here. they're very toothy animals. Also, all the scales on their back are worn down much more so than a wild animal would be. And that's just because these animals live in very high densities on farms and they crawl over each other and, and just kind of buff each other down all the time. An alligator's biting power can be measured with this specially constructed instrument. Kent tests the mechanism, which has jokingly been called the bitometer, by putting his full weight on the sensors. A little over 200 pounds. The meter is experimental, and so measurements are approximate. But the moral is clear. Treat alligators with caution. Since 1981, Kent Bleat has made a detailed study of alligator behavior in the mating season, from April into June. But Kent was not happy with his original vantage point. It was secure but didn't provide an accurate water level view. He decided to enter the lake, a procedure not without certain risks. It is possible when you're in the lake that a big male will decide he doesn't want you there and actually uh, come up and try to get you out of, <laughs> out of his territory. Um, we've had very few problems when I was swimming in the lake, but uh, there's always the potential for, for an alligator getting a hold of you and doing some real damage. Kent has found that alligators here at the farm are fairly harmless, especially during mating season. And to increase his knowledge, he puts this opinion to a highly meaningful test. We learned early on in our research that we needed to get off the boardwalks and go down and look at alligators at an alligator's eye level. Alligators communicate to each other visually by the way they hold their bodies out of the water. And we got down into the water to better understand how alligators are talking to each other in a visual sense. Kent has taken a lot of kidding about being up to his eyebrows and alligators and seeing eye to eye with his study subjects. But he feels that because he can understand an alligator's body language, he can ward off trouble before it becomes a real threat. I look for animals that are obviously directing themselves toward me as aggressive animals. The way they tilt their head, how high they hold their body out of the water are all indications if they're being aggressive or not. Not all the animals that come toward me are aggressive. Many are curious, but I still have to treat them all about the same. I can't let them get too close to me. I carry a large, uh, about five foot long cypress pole with me. And if an animal does get too close, I just nudge it away. And try to keep it out of out of strike range. 